Okay, so just want to welcome everyone in person and online. So those in person, uh, we're about to get started. So hello, hello, uh, we're about to get started. Um, anyway, so just, I just want to share kind of where I think we're going, and I don't really know exactly where we're going, but uh, last Thursday, no, yeah, last Thursday, we were riding up to Tennessee to Van Leer to the conference with uh, Terry Bennett and Chris, or Chris Reed and Josiah Bennett, and we were listening to Terry, a message that Terry was speaking, and in that message, he didn't say this, but I just felt like as I was listening to that message, I felt like the Lord said, the next Sunday when you get back, you're not to preach with any notes. I was like, yeah, I don't really like that word. So I, we, got this, we got this philosophy in our house that if you don't like a job and you don't really want to do that job again, do it really bad and you'll never be asked to do it again. So I might purposely like flunk this test because I don't like preaching without notes. So I was like, okay. And then I, at first I was thinking, okay, Lord, is that really your voice saying to me or just my own thoughts? And we, and we get there and we, get to, we were staying with Ben and Heather Dismukes. And Ben started talking. He's like, you know, one thing the Lord's really saying to me is like, he's saying to me, you're, you're too intellectual and you just need to let me possess you and fill you and don't rely so much on your notes. I was like, I think, Lord, you're, you're trying to confirm something to me for this Sunday that I'm not supposed to use notes. And so anyway, I was, you know, I, honestly, I, I forgot about that. And when we were driving to church, and I, I, if you even noticed, you got an email from me saying today's notes. Those were the, those were the notes that I prepared this week. And so when we, and I spent a long time writing those up. That took a long time. And so when, I, when I, we're driving here, we get a text from Chris and Randall saying, hey, the computer's broken. We don't know if we're going to be able to live stream. And so then at that moment, you're like, okay, well, I want to make sure this message that I was going to share is on live stream. So, Lord, what are you saying to do? And it was like then the Lord said, remember what I said to you writing up to, to Terry's is that you need to not speak from your notes this Sunday. So I was like, okay. Um, so I don't know where we're going to go. I don't know. I honestly have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth. So I'm just going to just open it and see where God might lead. So let's turn in our Bibles here to Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1.5, that we might understand the hour we live in. We live in a very, very prophetic hour we live right now. I really hope we can see that. I hope we can understand the hour of human history we live in. We are not living in the 1980s, the 1990s. Sometimes Anna thinks I'm still living in the 1980s. But we're not living in the 1980s. We're not living in the 1990s. We're not living in even before 2020. Time has changed. And the Lord's coming is closer than we might think. We are living in the end times. We are living at the end of the age. And Habakkuk, the prophet, says in verse 1, 5, he says, Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder. What? What? No. Yeah. I did not cancel class. Unless you want to hear me preach, but doubt you do. <clears throat> Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days, you would not believe it if you were told. Now, you don't really want to read the whole context there because it's about, about Babylon coming to invade Israel. <laughs> but I don't believe that's really, I mean, yes, there is, there is going to be some intense things that are coming, but I don't think that's really the context of this, me applying this here. I think it's more the Lord saying that what I'm about to do in your day it's so remarkable. It's so astonishing. It's so wonderful. It will blow your mind away of, of the hour we live in in human history that if I told you, you would not even believe it. God, help us in this hour that we would not have a heart of unbelief. We cannot have a heart of unbelief in this hour or we have no hope of standing and overcoming in the hour we live in. That's why the author of Hebrews said, take care, my brethren, that there not be in you. He's talking to believers. He's talking to those who are saved. He's talking to those who are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. 
He's talking to those who are regenerated, who have the Holy Spirit. See to it. See to it that there's not in you an evil heart of unbelief. This idea that, that somehow, once we get born again, our heart is going to forever have continuing faith is a lie. That's why James said in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. Watch, that, that's, what, that's what the author of Hebrews is saying to us. Watch over that there not be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Because when unbelief gets into your heart and doubt and cynicism get into your heart, Hebrews says, you fall away from the living God. We're witnessing this right now in our country as millions of professing Christians. And yes, I believe many of them were truly born again, though some of them probably weren't. Millions of born again Christians are deconstructing from their faith. And they're saying that Jesus is no longer the Messiah. See to it that there not be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God. Now, what I'm talking about here is not, I don't think anyone in this room really is having a struggle with, is Jesus the Son of God? Is he the Messiah? I, I think it's more along the lines of the unbelief that we would not recognize what God is doing in this hour. We are truly living in the most prophetic hour in human history. We are living in the most prophetic hour of human history. Yet our hearts can easily grow dull. Our hearts can easily grow into this place of cynicism and unbelief. And when that happens, we can miss the voice of God. In this hour we live in, it is more, it is more imperative than ever that we hear the voice of God. If we do not hear the voice of God for ourselves, we are not going to be able to stand in the hour we live in. We've got to be able to discern the Lord's voice for ourselves and through those vessels and messengers God sends. And we must be able to discern and understand and, and discern when a messenger comes in the name of Jesus Christ but he's deceiving you. Because that was the Lord's first warning in Matthew chapter 24. What the, the, the disciples asked him, they said, Lord, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And the very first thing, the very first thing Jesus said, he didn't warn them about the Antichrist. He didn't warn them about the earthquakes or the natural disasters or the solar flares or any of that stuff that you see in the book of Revelation. He didn't warn them about the trumpet judgments and the seal judgments and the bowls of wrath. He didn't tell them any about that stuff. He said the very first thing, it says, you see to it that no one misleads you. See, deception, especially now with YouTube, and YouTube just spread it. You can get any message you've ever wanted to hear on YouTube and the Lord's not saying that many are going to come in my name. They're not going to come saying that I am Jesus Christ. They're going to come in the name of Jesus Christ. They're going to come saying, I believe he's the son of God. I believe he's the Messiah. But Jesus said they're going to mislead many. You've got to be in the word of God in this hour. You cannot just be being fed on YouTube and on different uh, podcasts and stuff as your spiritual nourishment. I'm not saying you can't listen to those other things, but so many Christians these days, their spiritual nourishment comes from YouTube and their spiritual nour nourishment comes from their podcasts and they don't even get into the scriptures anymore. What have we come to if we're not getting into the scriptures? We have no hope if we are not getting into the scriptures. We've got to get back to the word of God. We've got to get back to the word of God and we've got to get back to the, the spirit of God. Jesus said, see to it that no one misleads you. See to it that no one deceives you. 
We've got to be able to discern the voice of God in this hour. The true, authentic voice of the Lord. Man, I, I feel stirred in this right now. I feel a stirring in my own life right now. It's like, God, you know, sometimes I, you can get away from that, the, the really hearing him. You get in those different seasons where you, you know, you're hearing him more clearly than you are other times. But we've got to hear his voice. You know, one of the most sobering things, one of the most sobering things to me I've ever read is in John chapter 12, where Jesus is praying right before the cross. He's saying, Father, save me from this hour. Save me from this hour. Glorify your name. And then the Father from heaven interrupts and to his son. He says, I have both glorified your name and I will glorify it. Yet what's so sobering is the crowd around Jesus thought it thundered. Others thought it was the voice of an angel. No, this is the voice of God Almighty coming out of heaven and speaking loudly and thundering, and the people thought it was just a natural occurrence. This is not a pagan nation. This is a, this is a nation that loved the, the Scriptures. This is a nation that loved God, yet they had zero discernment to recognize God Almighty, the Father, had spoken to Jesus. And some said it thundered. Others, you know, it's kind of like just that, you know, some said it thundered are kind of like those who are in the natural mind, in the reasoning of the mind, who thinks they can figure everything out with just logic and reasoning. You cannot, you cannot discern the voice of God through logic and reasoning. He is far beyond your own thoughts, far beyond your own ways, far beyond anything you could imagine. You cannot discern his voice by human reasoning. Now, the others thought it was an angel. That's kind of the charismania crowd. So you have kind of the religious crowd that tries to take everything and say it's just a natural occurrence. And you have the charismania crowd that says just an angel. No, this is not just an angel that spoke. This is not just some weird, strange, charismania, quote-unquote, pathetic nonsense. God's voice is thundering from heaven. And the, it seems like from the text, the only one that really discerned who it was was Jesus. It was not just a natural occurrence. It was not just some charismania type phenomenon. It was the very voice of God thundering from heaven to his son. And he's doing it again. Are you going to just say what God's speaking is just a natural occurrence that can be reduced to logic and human reasoning? Are you going to associate it with some weird charismatic experience that doesn't fit into Scripture? Or are you going to hear the true voice of God in this hour? We've got to hear His voice. <clears throat> We've absolutely got to hear His voice. Hearing the voice of God is what gives birth to true faith. Hearing it in the word, the remas, the, the remas of God, hearing it in your spirit, hearing it in prophetic experiences, dreams and visions. But hearing the voice of God is what gives you true faith. Jesus said, when, I come, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? I want to be a man of faith. I hope you want to be a person of faith. A person whose faith is not shaken no matter what we are going through, even in this nation. Some of us are just not aware of what's going on in this nation. We are at war in this nation. I hope you can see that. We are at war. Now, it hasn't turned into blue and gray uniforms yet. It hasn't turned into bullet. Well, there was a bullet shot last Saturday, but we are at war in this nation. We are in a battle in this nation. For real, we are at war. It hasn't yet, yet become what we envision as a civil war, and I hope it doesn't. But it could have. It could have, it could have happened, and it could still happen. I mean, we are truly living in this time. I hope we can understand that there are globalist powers 
at work, who I believe is the beginning of the seventh kingdom of the Antichrist, that are at work trying to destroy the sovereignty of this nation. And they have been for 50 plus years, since World War II, or whenever that, I didn't do the math in my head, since 80 years, whatever that is, whatever that number is. A long time, globalist powers have been at work to destroy the sovereignty of this nation. We are living in the time of the seventh kingdom that's been talked about in the book of Revelation, rising up, it's coming out of Europe, it's coming out of the World Economic Forum, it's coming out of the UN. All the nonsense you see going on in our nation is this attempt to destroy the sovereignty of this nation. We are at war. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to prepare you for the hour we live in. And so we've got to hear the voice of God. We are living in that hour when the seventh kingdom of the Antichrist is rising up. The Antichrist has not yet come onto the scene as the world leader, but we're living in that hour where the formation of that kingdom is rising up out of Europe and is coming into this nation, penetrating into leadership. I mean, our, our government has been overtaken by this. That's, that's why our, our, the nonsense, we just open the boards and let anyone come in. I'm not trying to get political. I'm just trying to say, listen... We live in an hour when this nation is under assault. This nation's under assault. The church must be aware of that. We've got to be like sons of Issachar who know the times and the seasons. We are not living in pre-2020. We're living in a new time and a new season. We're living in a new age. Now, I think we're getting into that age when the kingdom of God is birth in the earth, but we've got to have that discernment. We've got to let, get out of the mind that's being fed by mainstream media. Okay, if you haven't realized mainstream media is just a, a flood of lies, okay, let this be a wake-up call to you, okay? They are not telling you. They're telling their own narrative of what they want fueled by globalists who have millions of dollars. I'm, I'm making it simple, okay? We've got to be aware of this. We've got to be those who love the truth. G the, Lord, the Word of God says that those who do not love the truth, listen, those who do not love the truth, they will be given a spirit of delusion, from God. We've got to love the... Listen, we've got to love the truth. We've got to love the truth. Because if we don't love the truth, not the devil, God will give those who do not love the truth a spirit of strong delusion. God, help us in this hour. Now, I meant this to be good news, but it's coming across <laughs> whatever. I'm just, I, have no, I have no idea what I'm going to say next, so just brace yourself because I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> but in this hour in history, when the, t when the seventh kingdom mentioned in the book of Revelation is rising up, the one that will give birth to the Antichrist and the ten kings, in this hour of human history, God has a solution. God has a plan. It's not just darkness and deep darkness. It is that. But I want to tell you, there is a glory that is coming. There is a glory of God that is coming. The glory of God will shine upon his people. Deep darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness of people, but the Lord's glory will rise on you and his glory will be seen upon you. Isaiah chapter 60. God's glory is rising up in his people. And in that dark time of human history, God's people will be those, listen, it's a remnant. May it be us. It's not every believer, but it's a remnant in whom the morning star Christ himself rises up in our hearts. We've got in this hour to be possessed by Christ. We've got to be possessed. Or we no longer live, but Christ in us lives. May he have your heart. 
May he have your soul. May he have your mind. May he have your will. May he have your emotions. May he have your body that you would be his, his servant, his bond servant that would say, Lord, I want to obey you. I want to obey you. No matter what, I want to obey your voice, Lord. God needs, and God is giving birth to in this hour, a new form of leadership. God's end time apostles and prophets. I believe it's talked about that in Revelation 14, the 144,000. I mentioned that in the sermon from July the 7th. I believe you can look at it just to make it really, really simple. Just like you would see in the Gospels when it said the 12. You can just do a word search on this in the Gospels where it says the 12, the 12, the 12. And you can just, I mean, it's mentioned 10, 20, 30 times. The 12, the 12, the 12. That you can look at the 144,000 and see that it's the 144,000. It's that same type of idea. It's God's end time apostles. An apostolic vessel, a prophetic vessel that God is raising up. It is the army of the Lord in the day of his power. Those who have been marked out for war for the time we live in. This is the army of power. I'm telling you, we're moving into a day and a time in history, in the greatest time in history in the whole church age, the whole time of church history. We are moving into that time where it says in Revelation 12, 10, now the salvation has come. Now the power has come. Now the authority has come. Now the kingdom of our God has come. Why? Why now? Because there is the birthing from the womb of the overcoming church the overcomers in uh, Revelation 12, 5, the mature son is coming forth out of the womb of those who are in travail, crying out for the birthing of God's new leadership. And this leadership is going to be given the eternal gospel. And when they're given the eternal gospel to preach, not just the gospel of salvation, though that's part of it, and that's hugely important. I'm writing a book about that. It's so important. But it's more than the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the gospel of God's eternal purpose. It's the gospel that Jesus Christ is the sum total of what God the Father wants. And he wants that in a people. He wants that in a church. He wants that in a possession. He wants that in a bride. He wants that in a family of sons. And when this, when this man child, this son is birthed from the womb of the Hannah church, the overcoming church, in travail, in intercession, crying out, for that to be birth, then and, uh, and then at that time, God's solution comes forth, his end time ar- generals of his end time army, God's apostles and God's prophets. And they come onto the scene and God entrusts to them the eternal gospel. And that eternal gospel is to be preached to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And then you see in Revelation 14, when they do that, Then the Son of Man puts in a sickle and reaps the harvest. Why is he reaping the harvest then? Because the 144,000 have been marked to preach the eternal gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. And then if you compare Revelation 14 with Revelation 7, you see the very same thing, that the, the eternal gospel goes out to every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. And then in Revelation 7, after they're sealed, what you see is that coming up out of the great tribulation are people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. It's exactly what Jesus said. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. I'm telling you, we are living in a historic, prophetic moment in this hour of history. What a time to be alive. If I told you, if the Lord told us everything, we would not even believe it. It's incredible. The greatest power even greater than the first century, I believe. It's the power that was given to Moses in Egypt when he confronted Pharaoh, the authority he had to to judge wickedness and confront leadership, the power they had in the book of Acts where Peter's shadow walked by and he healed the person who was lame, 
Some people just want to say, well, that never happened again. That, was, that passed away after the first apostles. And some people, that's kind of the cessationists. They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Well, some in the charismatics say, oh, we believe that. And they try to create that. And they have tried to create that. And they've created an Ishmael that's just charismania, charismatic nonsense. But I'm telling you, the real stuff's coming. The real power of God is coming. The real authority of God is coming. Now, I can't tell you when, but I'm telling you, it's coming. And that power, that authority is coming. The greatest authority that God has ever entrusted is coming to this end time John the Baptist, Elijah Vessel, this John the Baptist forerunner company. They are going to have the authority of Christ. The authority of Christ has come. Now, that tells us, if we're moving into that hour when the authority of Christ has come, that tells us. As leaders, and I'll say this as leaders, we better make sure there's nothing in us. God, there's nothing in us that would take advantage of God's people. That is being exposed in the church, spiritual abuse. In fact, you can look at the book of Jude and realize, okay, the, the warning of Balaam, the sin of Balaam, they, they, they've gone the way of Balaam. Well, what did Balaam do? Balaam used the prophetic to manipulate people, and then in this particular case, to get money for himself. But you can use the prophetic to manipulate people to get anything you want. Money, influence, position, power, sex. You can use the power of persuasion. You can use your platform. You can use whatever God has given you as a leader to use that to abuse God's sheep. God's exposing that right now. And God is also exposing at the same time the rebellion of Korah to say that, well, if the leaders are like this and they're abusive and they're taking advantage of God's people, then really it doesn't, then really we're just submitting unto, to Jesus Christ and not to spiritual authority. Both are wrong. Both are wrong. The balance God wants to bring is that God, has, God works through leadership. God works through apostles and prophets and teachers, fivefold ministers. God works through these leaders and everything. If we want to be what God wants us to be, divine order is imperative. That's why we can't just say, well, I don't feel like coming to church today. I was out late last night. And then we just sit at home and try to live stream it. You cannot get what God wants to do live streaming in your pajamas, drinking your coffee. We've got to be together. We cannot forsake the assembling of the, of the gathering together under the headship of Jesus Christ. The, the time is too urgent. The time is too important. That, and, and that verse in Hebrews was written when we see the day coming near. When we see the day coming near and what we're seeing in, the, in America is the exact opposite. The day's coming near and there's more people that have left the church. Now, some churches, many churches, I don't blame them for leaving. I would leave too because most of them are just like, what are you even talking about? What are you even doing? But if the Spirit of God is moving and Jesus Christ is truly the head of the church and the leadership is in submission to the headship of Jesus Christ saying, God, have your way. We don't want it to get in the way of what you want to do. We want you to be a conduit through which you, we, we, you, you move through us to do what you want to do, then if that is the case, then church is of utmost importance because we're coming together under the headship of Jesus Christ. And divine order is of utmost importance because we, if we don't come into divine order and we're, we go the way of Korah and we say, well, we don't need to submit. We hear God ourselves. We hear God ourselves because we have our own relationship with God. Now, that's true. You do have a relationship with God. But there's some things God only speaks to leadership. And I, I hate this for you because you got to sometimes get it from me, which is not always easy. But, and it's the case with any leader because that's God's order. That's God's order. And so I would encourage you, anything I say or Dad says or Randall says or Michael says or whoever shares, take that, go into Scripture and say, Lord, speak this to me. Confirm this to me. Remember, well, you know, one of the things that I found is, like, like for example, when Noel first started coming, I mean, some of the stuff he started, was sharing to us, I was like, what is this guy here? This, this, what's this guy even talking about? This is so, I've never heard this before. 
My initial reaction was just to say, it's just, it's just thunder. But, sorry, I got a text. I forgot to. Oh. Um, my, my initial reaction was just to say, that's thunder. But when I said, okay, no, I'm actually going to go to the Lord and I'm going to ask him, Lord, what are you saying in this? And he began to speak what he was speaking to me through Noah. I was like, ah, oh, that's right. That's accurate. That is, Lord, what you're saying. And so I just encourage you, even over the next several weeks or months, as we get into this teaching, as God leads, as God brings in this, this, this idea of what God is giving birth to in this hour, that we would understand that, that we would take it back to the Lord. Don't just, on the one hand, don't just uh, gullibly accept what I say and just say, yeah, well, he said that. It's true. No, don't do that with anybody. Don't do that with me. Don't do that with that. Don't do that with anyone. But at the same time, don't get into that place of it, it's thundered in human reasoning and say, I don't believe that's the Lord. No, the balance is we take what is spoken. Please take what is spoken and go back to the word of God and let him confirm it to you. Okay, so over the next, over the next uh, starting in August, I'm going to start talking about um, the day of his power. So just let me take a, a step back and just explain to you kind of the context here. As I shared on July 7th how I was debating, I was saying, okay, Lord, um, I feel like I, you're, you're leading me. It was on a Monday, and I had to get the message for Sunday, and I shared this on July 7th, but, Lord, just to say it again so you get it again, is... It was Monday, July 7th, and I felt like the Lord's stirring me. I want you to preach on the Lord's army of power, and I want you to talk about the 144,000. And I was in my mind going, I don't want to do that because that's a lot of work over July 4th weekend. I want to enjoy it like everybody else. I want to relax like everybody else and have fun and enjoy my time. And I was wrestling with this. I want to do something that I could just do easily, and the Lord's like, Okay, and I, was, and I was praying about it. I've been wrestling with it all week. And on Friday, I was praying, God, God, show me exactly what you want me to share on Friday or on Sunday. And at that very moment, a friend of mine in California sends me the email and he says, he says, I got a word for you. It's from Joel chapter 2. And it really, in the context, it's about the Lord's end time army. And he said, when I was done uh, sharing or, or getting this word, I looked at my, my phone and it was 144. He was up at 144 California time praying. Um, and he said, I feel like God's saying the 144,000. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I was praying about. It's exactly what I was trying to like figure out. Do you want me to share, share that or not? You cannot make that up. I want you to just, so, and this is not just about me. This is about us. Okay. I'm not just sharing a word for me. This is a word to me for us. This is about what God wants to speak to us and what God wants to do among us corporately is, you know, that's why I'm sharing this again. It's about us. It's not about me, okay? It just happened to come to me, and, but it's about us. I want you to hear God confirming this to us of what the importance of this army God wants to give birth to in this day and hour we live in. And so, you know, I, I shared that, and uh, I shared that on July the 7th, and, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll share it. July 7th, I shared it. Then two days later, I said I wasn't going to use my notes. I will read this one thing, okay? So if I get struck by lightning, you know I shouldn't have shared it. Uh, um, but I do want to read this one thing, and we get an email two days later. Okay, just pay attention. This is important. This is for our, this is for our call. Two days later, I get an email from Shank. Shank. Frank Shanahan, I'm talking so fast, I'm getting my, my words mixed up. Frank Shanahan, Frank Shanahan emails me and he says, hey, listen, um, two days later, he says, uh, a, a lady named Faye, she's an inter a very trusted, faithful intercessor at their church. She happened to be going through her drawers and clearing things out, and she came across a book that she had dreams in. And she saw a dream from 2007 that was a dream about uh, their church, Zion Christian Ministries, and our church, Restoration Life. And she felt particularly stirred to share this with Frank. And then when Frank sent me the email, he says, hey, I'm writing this to you because I, I just want to encourage and reaffirm God's call upon Restoration Life Church and Life School. So this is a the word of the Lord to, to us, it's not just about me, to us and the call God has on us. 
And so anyway, this is what Faye said. I won't go through the entire details of the dream, but this is what she said. This is from back in 2007, and Faye writes this and said, as I woke up, it was as though I was still in the dream, and I felt the Lord was saying that just as Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and the Jordan were such important places to the children of Israel as they entered the land, and then such important places to Elijah and Elisha. Now, here's where it gets to us. So Atlanta was a strategic place in early American history, so the Lord now wanted to raise up an Elijah company in Atlanta as forerunners whom he would use powerfully. And he wanted to use Restoration Life Ministries even as forerunners to the forerunner Elijah company he would raise up. Now, for those who really were paying attention on July 7th, you know that I said this army in the day of God's power is an Elijah army. I, I said that this is a John the Baptist army. This is an Elijah army. This is forerunners. This is a corporate company of, of people who are preparing the way of the Lord like John the Baptist with the spirit of Elijah on them. This is, you know, I, I, I said this, this is an Elijah army. And so I, I emailed, I'm, I'm skeptical by nature. I just want to make sure if we're saying anything prophetic, we vet things out. Okay, is this really God? Because it's two days after I preached that very message. And I said, Frank, did, did Faye listen to us online? Because sometimes, you know, you never know. I don't, don't think she's sitting around listening to me. But um, I just wanted to make sure, okay, did she hear me, what I said online? Is she confirming, like, hey, I heard your message and I'm confirming. She's like, no. I emailed Frank then. He said, no, uh, she, she definitely wasn't listening to you online. So <laughs> here God has shown us this dream or this, this uh, confirming word, the moment I'm praying about what to speak on on July 7th. Two days later, Faye happens to be clearing, clearing her drawer out, feels prompted by the Holy Spirit. But in fact, I think it's through Faye that we met Noel through a long way. Yeah, Faye's the one who, through divine connections, introduced us to Noel, which got us into the forerunner call even in the first place. Long story, I won't go there. But so anyway... To think the Holy Spirit stirred her at that very moment, at that very time, and she finds this dream that is a word to us that confirmed, basically, it was exactly the message that I preached on July the 7th. I mean, different language, but the same concept. An Elijah army, a forerunner army that would prepare the way of the Lord and make the church ready. I say all that to say, okay, the Lord is speaking to us prophetically right now in this time and this season. This is not for me. This is not for dad. This is for restoration life. This is for life school. Okay? So you're with me here. Do you see the confirmation? Okay. Here's your homework assignment. Okay? Take that word that was those two words that were given me on front, and you can get the, you can, I can send it to you in the email, or you can listen to this again. And, and ask the Lord to speak them to you. And what would the Lord say to you through that? Okay, because things are so much better when you hear the Lord than when you have to hear the Lord through a leader. You see what I'm saying? It's way, I promise you, it's way better if when I get up and speak, it's just confirmation to what the Lord's already telling you than if you have to hear it from me and you have to go in and say, okay, I'm not sure if this is the Lord or not. Ask the Lord to confirm it to you because what will happen if, if he confirms that to you what will happen is we all begin to rise in faith and go, God is certainly speaking. God is certainly speaking. Okay. So now I just want to talk about the, the conference, the conference we went to with uh, Terry and Josiah and Chris Reed. Um, Anna's not in here, so I can share one story. And she probably, I highly doubt she's going to listen to me online. So anyway, uh, Chris Reed spoke on Saturday morning and... Uh, Afterwards, Anna was like, that was an experience. That was awesome. I'm like, what? I've never ever heard you say that at all. She's like, and then she was like, Dad, why don't you preach more like Chris Reed? I'm like, well, uh, you know, if you listen to Chris Reed, he's pretty Pentecostal. So I'm like, well, you know, if I preach like Chris Reed, I wouldn't be able to move for a week because he exerted so much energy. I mean, he... I don't have that much energy, but she's like, why don't you preach like Chris Reed? Why don't you, you know, you know, you need to be more funny like Chris Reed. I'm like, yeah, if you saw Chris Reed, he had like a red sport coat on with a black shirt and black pants. And when he got up, I texted uh, Ben and Josiah. We had this thing going. I said, hey, 
I can tell you this is going to be annoying because he has Georgia colors on. And it was. It was, a, it was probably the best presentation of the gospel I've ever heard. It was an amazing message. If you haven't heard it, you should listen to it. An amazing presentation of the gospel, walking through Romans just in a beautiful, beautiful way. But Anna was so blessed by it, so touched. So, yeah, I think she wants me to start dressing like Chris Reed. It's like, yeah, I don't think that would work. Um, he's even taller than me. He's 6'7 six, six, or 6'6. Six, six. But anyway, I'm not, back, to the, back to the main point here is this conference was, uh, was so powerful. It was so timely. It, it was so timely. That's what I want to, you know, really stress and connect it back to us. This was not just some random conference. This was the, the Lord's timing. I want us to get the timing of this. I want us to see the timing of this. I want us to see what God's confirming and even the, 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 how things are synchronizing between what God's saying here to us and what God's saying to Terry. Um, this is not to build up a man or anything like that. It's more, I, I just, I believe with all my heart, God has raised up Terry to lead this movement, whatever. I'm trying to, trying to describe this sometimes it's hard because it's, I don't mean to be like use Christian cliche or buzzwords, but it's just sometimes hard to articulate the prophetic words into human language that would make it easy to understand. But Terry's leading this, I'm just going to call it this end time move of, of apostles and prophets, this John the Baptist vessel that would, that would be used at the end of the age to prepare the bride. And that really was the theme of this conference, the eternal gospel. And the fact that this gospel, the, let's, let's actually read uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. This is after... Revelation 14, 1 through 5, which is the marking of the 144,000. What, you know, this is really sometimes hard to understand. But if you will think of the 144,000 not as ethnic Jews or not as like the recovery of the 10 lost tribes of Israel, you know, like I talked about that on July 7th. Why well, I don't believe that. I think it was allegorical, metaphorical language in Re Revelation 7 to say these have been marked out for war in the Lord's end time battle. But if you'll, if you'll take the, think of the phrase, the 144,000, the same way as you would think of the 12 when you read it in the Gospels, um, I, I, it makes, makes, helps me make so much more sense. This is, these are the 12. These are the 144,000. These are the end-time apostles that have God's governmental, God's governmental authority and fullness to preach the eternal gospel. Now, let's look at Revelation 14.6. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tongue and uh, every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And I've always been kind of confused by that. I was like, okay, Lord, are you saying an angel is going to, in the last three and a half years, basically an angel is going to preach the eternal gospel? I, I just... That's never happened. I mean, that's never really happened. An angel, it's usually through human messengers, human vessels. And I, I believe if you understand Revelation 14, 1 through 5, like I've explained it, and I'll explain it a lot more in the weeks to come, no, these are God's end time messengers. These are God's apostles and prophets. These are God's generals in the army in the day of his power. These are the ones that have been set apart by God as bond servants to preach the gospel in all nations, not just the gospel of salvation but the full eternal gospel, then what's happening here, if you notice, it's the next verse that comes out of this, of this vision God sees of God's end time, or John sees of God's end time apostles and prophets. And then in verse 6, they're given the eternal gospel. It's not the angel that's preaching the eternal gospel. It's these messengers, these, this vessel, this army, these generals in God's army. They're the ones that are preaching this eternal gospel gospel. And so also, what you, I want you to take note of this in, in verse 6, and I want you to just even study Revelation 14. We're, we're going to go into more depth than this in, in the weeks to come, is the angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel, having a good news is what gospel means, good news that was before time and creation and will extend beyond 
into the eternal ages. It's the everlasting good news. It includes the gospel of salvation, justification, sanctification, glorification. But it's more than the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the gospel that Jesus said would be preached in all nations as a witness, and then the end will come. And so, just to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm, I so appreciate all these mission organizations that want to get the scriptures into the language of every, every uh, nation and tribe and tongue, and that's awesome. That's part of this being fulfilled, what Jesus said in Matthew 24. But that's not really the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom has not yet been preached in every, every nation, tongue, tribe, and people, but it will be. Because the gospel of the kingdom, you can think about it this way, the gospel of the, of the, the, gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the eternal gospel, it's really synonymous, in my opinion, of God's eternal purpose. It's very synonymous with the book I wrote, The Eternal Blueprint. It's the plan that God established before time and creation in the eternal Godhead that's more than salvation. Salvation was the means, but there was a purpose that was even greater. Salvation is just the means to restore us back into what God wanted. And we've summarized it that it is, it is uh, to, to Jesus Christ would be the head. Jesus Christ would be the head of his church. Jesus Christ would have preeminence in all things, that God would have a, a bride who is worthy of him. God would have a bride who's been prepared. The Father would have a family of Christ-like sons who've been conformed into his image. The Spirit would have a house and a temple and a body that he fills and possesses. And that, the, that believers, you and me, we would, we would come into the inheritance that Jesus Christ has of eternal intimacy, eternal authority, eternal glory. And salvation Justification, sanctification, glorification is the means to get us back restored into the eternal plan and purpose of God. This is the eternal gospel. Yes. And God is raising up end time prophets and apostles, messengers who will prepare the way and preach this eternal gospel in the nations to make the bride ready, to see God's sons come up into full Christ-like maturity. What a glorious hour. Here's what's so amazing. Is when we went to Africa, and me and Dad and Michael, we went to Africa in February, and, and the Lord gave Dad this very scripture before, I think it was before he knew Terry was going to talk about that. Yeah, it was before Terry, he knew Terry was going to talk about it. So you realize we're not just trying to copy what Terry Bennett says, okay? Some people probably, you're just trying to be like Terry Bennett. We're not. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm not trying to be like Chris Reed. <laughs> I'm not trying to be like Terry Bennett. I'm being Brian Kessler, okay, for good or for worse, you know. We're, we're, we, you know, once you get to a certain age, you don't care anymore. That's probably good. So I'm at that age. I don't care. I'm not trying to be anyone else except me. But so just to say that, because I know I've heard that before. Y'all are just being like Terry Bennett. And it's like we are not being like Terry Bennett. Dad got that word before we even, we even left. And that was kind of, that was really the theme of the whole conference in Africa. So you know, maybe we're forerunners to Terry. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm just, that's a joke. That's a joke. But um, so we, we go into Africa, and basically we gather 30 leaders from all these different nations, and we're, we're training them and equipping them, giving them the eternal gospel. And so right now, it, this conference comes in this last weekend, and the theme of it is the eternal gospel. Time for the eternal gospel as we're saying that, the beautiful timing of God, this is what I want you to see, the beautiful timing of God, even as that conference is being done, we have our leaders in 10 different nations going through the eternal blueprint, the book of the eternal blueprint, God's eternal purpose, being equipped, being trained, internalizing the message, owning it, living it, uh, 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 multiplying it, proclaiming it. They're getting it deep inside of them so that they're being equipped exactly what you see in Revelation 14. You cannot make up this, this timing of God. I hope you see the Lord's hand in this. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And it, it just, it, it's, listen, I know some people have said we want to be on the cutting edge of what God wants to do. And I, I, I feel like right now, we, in some sense, we are on the cutting edge of what God wants to do. And it's, it's something that, I'm not saying it as a pride or elitism or any of that. 
I'm saying it with humility, like we can in, in like one millisecond fall away from being on that edge if we get anything, if we do anything that's not by the Spirit of God, okay? So it's so beautiful in the leading of the Lord and the way the Lord leads us, not trying to be anyone but ourselves, and the, the beautiful parallel there between what uh, Terry's conference was about and the way God has been leading us. It's beautiful. So that said, that said, I feel the Lord, the Lord's direction to begin, um, I don't know how many weeks it is going to be, uh, six, eight weeks, um, going through Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 11, just walking through it line by line because I believe it has been uh, very misinterpreted, very misunderstood. I mean, I'm, I'm just now coming to understand many things in this. And yet, I, I believe it is one of the most important things God is saying to the church in this hour. And it's imperative that we have understanding. It's imperative that we have uh, the knowledge of, okay, this is what this means, how to interpret these things. And so I wanted to set the context of this to, sh to tell you the why, okay? Because if you just try to start hearing me talk about, I've done this enough, Revelation 12, Revelation 14, and those things, there's so much symbolism. You can be, you can just swarm in the, get lost in the depth of symbolism and not realize, okay, why am I even, why do I even care who the woman is that gives birth to this son who's caught up to God into his throne? Why do I care who the 144,000 are? Why do I even care? So we don't understand the why behind this, then we can easily realize, okay, why are we spending so much time? It's impractical and it's the farthest thing from that. It is the blueprint of God's end time plans that I believe have been triggered and birthed at this very hour. Now, I don't know how many years it is until we see the fullness of this manifest. There's a lot of work that needs to do. There's a lot of prayer that needs to go on. And I, I believe even the Lord is saying to us corporately that one of our main, and he has been saying this, we just didn't hear it. And I didn't, I, I didn't hear it. Okay, I did not hear it. In fact, Josiah, two years ago, said to us that we were to be like Hannah, who gives birth to the man-child, and we were to be like the woman in Revelation 12 that gives birth to the overcoming son. He said, I'm, not, I'm probably paraphrasing it somebody. He said something along those lines. I believe that that really is one of our, and we've been doing it in measure, but I believe God wants to bring that to a, an entirely uh, deeper more fuller expression that God really has called us in prayer and intercession and in ministry and you know what all we're doing in life school is that we are we are giving birth to this overcoming son a a whatever you want to call it a, a new breed of leadership and, and the final breed of leadership God's end time apostles and prophets that are literally going to be sent out into all the nations and I, I believe Listen, this is, again, this is, sounds crazy. I believe God has given us, this tiny little church, the assignment of Africa. Not just a few nations, the continent. Now, I don't know, there, God might raise up others. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. But God wants to take this group... God wants to take our 30 leaders and God wants to get us equipped, trained in the eternal gospel, equipped with the eternal gospel and preach this throughout Africa. Now, now we won't be going and preaching it throughout Africa. We might send dad to the Congo or... <laughs> I like my four-star, five-star hotels in the Kuru. That's, yeah, definitely not in the Ivory Coast. No, I mean, if God sends dad there, I'll be all for it, but, or Michael. Um, but God wants us, I, I want us to get the, the vision of this. It's, it's impossible, <laughs> but I believe it's the Lord. God wants, God wants us to play, whether it's we're the only ones, probably not, but a significant role 
of Revelation 4, training the end time apostles and prophets, the end time messengers of the Lord in the eternal gospel, for them to be sent out into the nations in Africa. Now, you might think, well, I want something that's more practical to me. Maybe we can just get off of our own. I've got to have something practical for me in my best now. I'm getting on to God's, God's agenda, right? We want to, I don't, I, it's like, whether they do it or we do it, I just, we're, we're called here locally through giving, through work, through travail, through prayer, through becoming. So we can't just like go off and do this end time work and this assignment God's given us and us here be half-hearted and lukewarm and have a gap between what we preach there and what we live here. We've got to become the message. You've got to become the message. I've got to become the message. You've got to get it, own it, internalize it, make it your own. God will not allow us to have that kind of influence until we have the corporate here coming up into the fullness of this. And you can't, I'm telling you, you cannot, I say this every Sunday it feels like, you cannot get it by hearing a message on Sunday. You cannot get it just by this, you can get stirred, but that seed does not get into your heart. Maybe the seed is planted. Maybe that seed's planted, but you've got to cultivate it. You've got to grow it. You've got to own it. You've got to know it. You've got to internalize it. You've got to eat the book yourself to become it. Become the message. Become the message. Become the message. Now, obviously, I'm talking about that's the message of Christ. The prophecy of the book of Revelation is the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm saying here, we've got to own it. We've got to live it. We've got to proclaim it. We've got to multiply it. We've got to become this message. And I believe that nothing is impossible for God. That God can transform the, the continent of Africa through a Gideon's army. If they will give themselves wholly to this in prayer and intercession and generous giving and you know, you know, laboring in the work of the ministry to see this done. So we've got, I, I believe God, if, if we will give ourselves wholly to this, we have in a, in, a, in a measure for sure, but if we will give ourselves more and more wholly to this, God will change a nation. God will change a continent. And it kind of reminds me of Paul when Paul said, I don't want to preach anywhere where another man has laid a foundation. That was the apostolic mandate of Paul. I don't want to go and lay a, try to lay a foundation where another man has already laid a foundation. He's, he's, not ta he's mainly talking about, I don't want to go into a place where the gospel has already been established. And in our context, what we're saying is we want to raise up an army in Africa. And we want to plow into the ground where the eternal gospel has not gone. I don't think the eternal gospel has gone very far at all in Africa. I believe we've seen the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is all throughout Africa right now. God wants to raise up messengers and apostles and prophets. And I believe God wants to give us to give birth to that. And in giving birth to that, God then will bring down the prosperity gospel and bring forth the eternal gospel. And God will make a bride ready in Africa, and he's going to use us to do that. What an incredible calling. Amen. Amen. Okay, 1201. We'll just stop there. So let me, just, let me pray, and we'll just see what the Lord wants to do next. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for just doing whatever you just did. That's great. So, Lord, we just, we give ourselves to you right now. We give ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves to you, Lord. And we just say, Lord, direct us. Direct us. Holy Spirit, direct us. Lord, 
what do you want to speak? What do you want to say? Lord, let this get deep in our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So what I feel like the Lord is saying to us right now is in four areas of response, no, five areas of response. The first area of response, now are we okay just to let the Lord move and we don't have to be rushed out to go eat or whatever, we just want to let the Lord move. But I, I believe there's four, there's five areas of response. Uh, the first area is that we corporately, everyone, this, is, this, is, this would apply to every one of us, that we would commit ourselves to becoming the message, okay? Now, the message that's being preached, eternal blueprint, indwelling life, we're doing that to some degree, but just to get that the bride of Christ and all that's the overcomers, all that's in, involved in that. But we would make a commitment to be like, we're not just going to hear, we're going to own. We're not just going to hear, we're going to own. Because without ownership of this, without that, that seed going down deep into the heart and the root systems going down deep, Jesus said, you'll fall away in time of testing. We've got to get a roots, we got to get our own root system in place that number one, we are going to own this message. We're going to become this message corporately. We're going to eliminate the gaps between what we, you know, you're, you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. We're going to eliminate the gaps that are, that are preached, what's preached out there and what we live here. And then number two is that we're, I feel like, you know, when we were there, Terry had, Terry had talked about, he, he had contacted several of the, full-time, or not full-time, but uh, preachers, those called to preach, and we made a, a uh, covenant vow to preach Jesus Christ and his return and to be his bondservants. And that, so I, I, what I feel like we need to do is that Dad and Michael and uh, maybe someone can get Randall, um, you know, because me, Dad, and Michael were there, so we, we, we made that commitment. And also Randall, uh, because he wasn't there, that we would, we would just do that here together, I feel like. Just to, just to renew that, just to, you know, kind of everything was so fast there, just to, in our own way, in our own words, say, Lord, we are making this vow to you. We're making this commitment to you to preach Jesus Christ as bond servants and, uh, and all that. And then number three, those who would give themselves, this is, I believe this is for all of us, but those who would give themselves to prayer and intercession for this purpose. Because this, this, this will not be birthed without travail and intercession. We're going to focus on that more in our corporate prayer times, but just that God would mark you out as intercessors for that purpose. The fourth one that I believe that, that the, you know, whether this is for those listening online, those in person, or both, I believe that, that even if you will commit yourself to giving generously to life school, I know we do give very generously to life school. It's amazing how generous we are. But even, even for some, if you will give yourself generously to giving to life school, God will multiply seed to the sower. God will increase your finances. God will give you even the more amounts of money so you can give even more. Because this thing is not going to be accomplished without lots and lots of money. So, that God would increase your finances. God would increase uh, as you give more and more and more. And remember, God's number is always a higher number. And then number five, those who would want to labor in the work that's involved. And if you are interested in that, you can see me. We can, we can figure out how to. Well, there, there's so much we need to do. Um, just So, yeah, those are the five things. So let's, let me just say, first of all, let's just stand. And we'll do number one. We're, we're making a commitment. Not, okay, don't make this commitment if you're not serious about it, okay? You can stand, you don't have to sit down, but if you're not serious about it, just don't, just don't agree with me, okay? Because 
The Lord holds us to the commitments we make. Um, but but just that we, if you feel like the Lord is leading you in this way, not, not out of guilt or pressure or obligation, if you have a witness with this in your heart that, yeah, I, I need to own this message more. I need to get it more in my heart. I need to be able to give verbal expression of it or sing about it or write about it or talk to my friends about it or proclaim it with my family. Just that, that you would say, God, I want to own this message deeper in my own heart. Just, just, just join me in prayer and just agree with me in prayer. Father, we just say right now, Lord, we say right now, Lord, we say that we make a commitment to you. I make a commitment to you. We make a commitment to you. Lord, to be a church that owns this message, that internalizes the message, that plants the seed in, the, in our hearts for this message. Lord, we, we make a commitment to you along these lines, and we say, yes, Lord, to this call. We will become the message. It will become a part of our DNA to the point where we can give expression of it to our friends and family and any place God would give us influence to share the eternal gospel. And, and a lot of that sharing of the eternal gospel is with the church because they have no concept of that. So, Lord, we just say yes to this call. Lord, mark us, we pray. Mark us, we pray, for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And then Dad and Randall and Michael, uh, you want to come up now? And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll just, you get the microphone maybe right there. <clears throat> um, and Dad, if you want to share anything. Feel free to, okay. Yeah, what we want to do right now is just, you guys come on up here, is we want to, as leaders here, and I'm, I'm saying Michael because he was there and he's a uh, house church leader, is, um, is we want to say, we, we just want to make, we want to make it really clear we're making that commitment to the Lord. Um, because we, we, you know, we just felt, I felt like it was so, uh, a little bit, ru not rushed, but it was like, I felt like we just, we just want to do it here as well, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so you guys just jump in too. But Lord, we just, we do come to you, Lord, as, as uh, messengers here, Lord. And we just say that, Lord, we make a commitment to you, Lord, to preach Jesus Christ. Lord, that we will not focus on the minors. We will focus on the one major, Jesus Christ. Obviously, that doesn't mean we can't teach other things, other topics, but our Jesus Christ is our message. We're not trying to build any platform or kingdom or anything for ourselves. Lord, it is about you. Lord, it's 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We preach Christ and ourselves as bondservants, Lord. We we just come and we just set ourselves apart to be your bondservants. Lord, we're not in this for any other reason except to do what you do and to say what you say. Lord, we will preach Christ and we will preach your second coming. And Lord, we just commit ourselves to you in that. And we make that, that commitment to you, Lord, in the fear of God that we will be your bond servants as leaders. And if you guys want to uh, add anything to that, just jump in. And then uh, uh, the third category is, is if you feel a call to intercession for this purpose, just raise your hands. I, I've got my hand raised and just want to pray for those who have their hands raised who have this feel like this is a call to intercession to give birth to this. Lord, we, we come to you, Lord, and we, we hear the call of God, Lord, to give birth to this end-time work of apostles and prophets, messengers, the John the Baptist vessel, Lord, to labor in prayer for Christ to be formed in these leaders, for, that, for, for them to come into the full stature of what it means to come into the fullness of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we just say, 
we say yes to this call of intercession. Lord, we make a commitment. Lord, even, even, be, even before we pray for those things we need to pray for, like our nation, we're going to focus first on the eternal purpose. And we make that commitment. Yes, we're going to pray for our nation. We have to pray for our nation. We have to pray for our nation in this time we live in. But Lord, even above that, we're committing ourselves to labor in prayer, Lord, for your solution to come forth. These, these generals in God's end time army, apostles and prophets who will bring the church into readiness in Jesus' mighty name. If you guys want to feel led to add anything, just jump in. And then those who feel like a stirring, you know, I know we're all generous, but you really either, you have been giving and would love to give more. You're um, you want to give more, but you're not there yet. Just, just like if, if you feel the, the, the calling to, to really, one of the ways you really contribute is through generosity, through giving. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you that God would multiply seed for the sower. Lord, we just pray there would be promotions. We pray there would be innovative ideas. We pray there would be breakthroughs, God. Um, for those committed to giving to this mission, to this work, to this mandate that is so beyond our imagination, Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that you would provide seed to the sower. Lord, you would provide the finances. You would, you would provide the breakthrough, Lord, for giving, to be able to give generously, Lord, into this work, we pray. And Lord, those that would also want to help in any kind of the work, whether it's videos or anything like that, just, we don't even, you may not even know, well, I don't even know how, just come see me and I can tell you how. But if you, if you have a desire to be a servant, to be a servant, to help the, the work of life school, and even to do it more, just we want to pray for you. We just say, God, we, we just pray you would anoint us for the work. Lord, the work that is required. Lord, there's so much work required. This vision's massive. I just pray, Lord, that you would anoint us for the work of this thing. Lord, we pray that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray today that you would seal today, seal today, as the marking, Lord, of a new commitment to you as messengers, intercessors, givers, becoming and working. In whatever areas and doors you open up, we'll stay in our area of influence. God, that we would not lay a foundation where another man is laid, but we would be the pioneers into that apostolic work you've called us to do here at the end of the age. And we say, yes, Lord, to that. Just, just agree with the Lord. Just agree and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We agree that we will do this, Lord. And I just pray that the grace of God would come upon us. The anointing of the Spirit would come upon us, Lord. To be anointed and empowered to do this work you've called us to as one people as one corporate body Lord we pray that in the name of Jesus Amen 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 Yeah, uh, yeah Just one thing I want to uh, add to that uh, that verse that Brian started with in Habakkuk uh, about you'd be surprised at what I'm going to do and all that um, if you go to Acts 13 uh, I don't have my Bible here or my glasses, but anyway, Acts 13, about 35 or so. Uh, yeah. You got, yeah. Uh, it, it says, and, and Brian can read it exactly, but it's talking about uh, King David and uh, after he had uh, gone to the grave, but it said that he accomplished the purposes of God uh, for his generation. And I think that's yeah. what God's really requiring exactly. us to do. He's yeah. at, that's what he's asked us to do is that uh, I, I totally agree with all that Brian said, that this is 
the, the, the work of the hour. Uh, and uh, we had, I mean, really the conference to me was more of a confirmation of what we were already doing yeah. than something radically different yeah. or new. Uh, so we've already been doing it. We, we, that was what we were doing uh, in February in Africa was calling, for, uh, calling forth this vessel uh, without realizing what he was going to be doing in the conference or what the Lord might be speaking prophetically. So it was, it's not really something new. Uh, and it's not what we've been doing, but the, the call, I believe, for all of us uh, is to be faithful for what, to what God calls us to do and be in our generation. Amen. And uh, I think this vessel, eternal gospel, and all that it entails, preparing a bride and all of that, uh, is, is what God's saying in this hour, uh, a major part of it. And our call is just to be faithful for what he's calling us to do. I mean, if you're not a, called as an apostle, you can't be an apostle. If you're not called as a teacher, you can't be a teacher. But everybody's called in some way, uh, and I think this is the overall umbrella of the way God is calling everybody in this fellowship. Uh, and so uh, that's my Amen. desire, and I think it would be yours. Let's be faithful to, this, to what God is saying in this generation. Amen. One thing, too, I just want to add in terms of uh, becoming the message. One thing I would encourage, again, this is not a, hey, go do this. It's just more something that's helped me out and, and, in becoming the message is going back through. Actually, I didn't even read it the first time. I read parts of it. But the uh, Eternal Blueprint book, like we're doing that with um, the mentors in Africa, and, you know, it's like we've heard these things and we've, li like we've gone very deep with these things. But when you read it from that, the context of going back through, it's kind of like it just becomes more solidified. At least it has with me. Um, and I think it's been very incredibly helpful for me. And I know we're, I can't remember, we're on like chapter 18 or whatever. Um, I know we all have a lot going on and I understand that. So this is not, hey, go do this, but I do, I will like encourage you. If you haven't, it is something that will help very much get this in your heart even more. And, and to really not just read it. I mean, if you're actually gonna read it just to read it, don't read it. But take, take time, take a year, take 18 months and just go deep in it and read it, take notes, study it, then move on, go slowly, there's no, there's no, don't read it to check it off. Only read it as if you want to really have this become part of you. Amen. 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 Well, we'll end the online portion here. And uh, okay, just 